get that in. I'll, so as not to, you know, be paranoid, I'll start in this this time. So that you don't think I just love that side more than I love the east side over here, the west side, the east, the east side. So there is some confusion. Um, I thought the one article review, the one that has the due date of February 25th, 2016, was hidden from you. That was from the previous semester, obviously. So, but they're both connected to the same graded item, so I think it will be okay no matter which one you submitted it to. But if you don't get a grade and you did submit it, let me know if you submitted it to the one that said due date February 25th, 2016 and I'll go in there and look at it. I should be um, mostly through with those. I'm hoping you turn them in last Wednesday. I try to get papers back to you within a week. That's my goal in, in this class, is to get the papers graded and back within a week. So there are 65 of you. I generally try to grade everything in one sitting that way. If I'm in a really bad mood when I start grading, everybody gets the same treatment. If I'm in an excellent mood, I give everybody the same treatment. It's, uh, it's a little difficult with a class of 65 to, to do that, to try and sit there and grade all of them at one sitting. So I, but I will try to get them done by Thursday. This Thursday, you are welcome to come and sit here and soak in by osmosis the knowledge that has been, you know, etched into these hollowed walls of academia. But I won't be here, and I, I suspect that most of your fellow classmates won't be here because it's what? Yeah. It's fall break, so take advantage of that, enjoy your fall break, and we will be back again today. So, on the syllabus, we're a little bit behind schedule, but that's okay because I have a day on there that says exam review. In the past, what I did when I built the syllabus and I kept it in the schedule was I used to stand up here and read you the exams, and students hated that. I got a lot of feedback on my student evaluations that said he never, like, you know, I couldn't keep up and couldn't write fast enough. So I decided I would just give you the old exams. So I just give you old exams that you can use. I will have a short review if you want to ask questions, and I'll give you some hints based on what I saw from the first exam on that day. Um, but I won't take the entire hour, so we should be able to get caught up with where we're, where we're supposed to be by the time of the second exam. So don't worry, I can be like Sherman marching to Atlanta when I need to in terms of covering material, and so we'll, we'll get caught up. I don't want you to feel cheated like you've gotten anything left off uh, of the content in this course. So today we need to talk about marketing segmenting, targeting, and positioning. If you go back to those early lectures that I talked about, for most of human history, I said the attitude was the production era. If you build it, they will come. The idea is that there were largely homogenous groups of people that had similar needs, and if you just came up with a better mousetrap, people would buy it. That was certainly true of the Ford Model T. The alternative to the Model T for most people at the time that Henry Ford invented that automobile was not the first automobile. He didn't invent the first automobile. And a lot of people think he did invent the assembly line. He didn't. What did he do? He improved on the assembly line by making it a moving assembly line. And so he, he improved on what was already there. There were automobiles, but they were largely curiosities for very wealthy people. And he saw that you could have this need fulfilled in terms of not having to go out and saddle the horse and, and ride. And it was slow and unreliable. And so basically, we were willing to accept that idea that we would have a car and if you, you could have it in any color you wanted so long as that color was black. But in more contemporaries, we've started to have to recognize that we're really not as homogenous as we think we are. We all have basic human needs, but once we get above that level on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, of the physiological needs being met, we all are different. 
if you look at just this classroom and the changes that I have seen in terms of the difference in terms of the content and makeup of the roster in my classes in my 20 something odd years of teaching here at UCO, it's changed radically. When I started teaching here at 22 years of age, a long time ago, our average freshman at that time, we were a fairly homogenous population. Our average freshman was, yeah. Our average freshman was 29. I was 22, so I was younger than most of our freshmen. Um, it was overwhelmingly Anglo. And it was overwhelmingly non-traditional students that were here at UCF. As I look out at the changes that have occurred, if we look at this room, you're not all what? You're not all 29. There's a variance in the age, although the age has gotten what? Younger. You've become more traditional, but there's still a variance in the age. You're not all ethnically white. And it's not all, you know, non-traditional students. You're, for the most part, pretty traditional. So there's been a lot of variance that's increased. And so the needs of students have changed, and we have to recognize that. And so marketing allows us the opportunity to, to, to do this, to recognize that there are differences in the markets. Once we get beyond those basic needs of food and shelter, but even at that low level, the kinds of needs that you have are maybe radically different. For example, one of the things that's become more prevalent is an acknowledgement that there are different diseases. We're coming up with new diagnoses all the time. If you went back in time 20 years ago, nobody had ever heard of anything called fibromyalgia. Now we have fibromyalgia. Nobody had heard 20 years ago, I can't remember anybody saying they had celiac disease. What is celiac disease? Anybody know? Gluten intolerance. Very few people actually have it, but there's a recognition now, and so there's this whole, like, you know, there are all these people that now don't want to eat gluten food because they think maybe they have celiacs. Probably they don't. Why is it that most people feel better if they get off a high gluten diet? It's low carbs and carbatics. I mean, you're probably a carbatic, not celiac. But there are even differences in diets now. We've, we've got, you know, this, even at the most basic level, this need to segment the market into various categories. So, what is market segmentation? Well, it's the aggregation of consumers into groups that have common needs and will respond similarly to a marketing action. So common needs and will respond similarly to a marketing action. What's the one thing, as diverse as this group is in here, that makes you a market segment? You're all students, and you're all students specifically enrolled in what? In marketing 3103 at 12.30, so you all will respond similarly to what? Although probably some of you haven't. It's amazing to me. So you all needed at least one thing to, to be in this class, and that's the what? The textbook. Although it's amazing, again, I have students that will say, I'm not doing very well in your class. Did you buy the textbook? Well, no. I didn't think I needed it. Kind of important. You might want to do that. Oh, you haven't come to class. That, that, that might, you know, like 50% of the questions come from my lecture and 50% of the questions come from the textbook. That might, might, might explain why you're not doing so well in my class. Uh, but every semester I have students that, that will say that to me. Yeah, I didn't buy the textbook. I didn't think I needed it. Really? So at least you have that. But even with regard to the textbook, how can you get the textbook? Now, you all have different needs. Maybe they're based on finances. So how can you get the textbook? When I was going to college, you had to go buy the textbook, and it came in one form. It came in this hard-bound thing. It was rather expensive, and you had to have it. How can you do the textbook now? And you had to buy it. There were two options at that point in time. You could either buy new or used. And the vast majority of people tried to buy one. Used. 
But the used always sold out because there was always more demand for the used than there was for the new, and so maybe you were left with the option of having to buy new. How can you now get the textbook in here? You can get it online. You can get it in print. You can get it, that's yeah, an ebook online, a download. How else? You can rent it. You don't have to buy it anymore. So these different options. You can get it as a loose leaf binder. They'll send you just basically the textbook pages. If you go through McGraw Hill Connect, you can buy just the you can get the Connect and just the loose leaf binder in here, and not have to buy the actual hardcover or even the softcover book. And it's slightly cheaper if that's what is of concern to you. So you all have at least that in common. So marketing segments are relatively homogenous groups of prospective buyers that result from the market segmentation pro process. And I told you at the beginning of class when I asked you to come up and, and identify your strengths and get into groups, that product differentiation is maybe the most important term in marketing today. <coughs> Almost everything is differentiating. Using different marketing mix activities to help consumers perceive the product to be better than competing products. When I was growing up, again, almost nothing with regard to commodities was segmented. But now, you have segmentation of even those basic staples of life that I grew up with. Again, when I was a kid, if you wanted milk, there were, you wanted milk for your cereal, there was two kinds. You could get what? You could get full fat, vitamin D, milk, or you could get, they didn't have 2% when I, was, when I was growing up as a little kid. There was full fat or skim, that was it. There was full fat or skim. Actually, there was a third category, which you all probably have never seen. It was called powdered milk, it was dehydrated, and it was absolutely the most disgusting stuff on the planet. Now you can get what? All kinds of milk. You can get all kinds of milk. You can get 2% milk, they have 1% milk. You can get lactose-free milk. It turns out that most people are slightly lactose intolerant. We're the only animal that drinks milk after the weaning, by the way, and most people are slightly lactose intolerant. Genetically now, we can, we can do your, your genetic DNA and find out how much lactose intolerant you are. Um, one of the things that they've done, and some of the research suggests, is that the further north you move from the equator that your ancestors were, the more, or, or the less uh, likely you are to be lactose intolerant. Why is that? If you think about going to Scandinavia and Europe and places like that, what? Yeah, well, uh, that the I'm not sure that that's long enough in the evolutionary process, but if you think about our ancestors moving from the Fertile Crescent to places like Scandinavia, Norway, what did they have to have? No. They had to have a source of protein that could last for a long period of time, and so what would that be? Cheese, yeah, you can you can store cheese for, you know, particularly if it's cold, for a long period of time. It's, it's a way of saving protein. So there's now lactose-free milk. You can get milk that has got no lactose. They've taken it out. What else can you get? You can get milk that's not milk. Almond milk. You can get almond milk, soy milk. What? Milk from things. Cashew. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can get all of them. You can get goat milk. You can get all of these things. You can get chocolate milk. That was, if you wanted, again, when I was a child, if you wanted chocolate milk, how did you do it? You bought Hershey's powder or Hershey's chocolate syrup and you made your own chocolate milk. You could be lazy now and just go to the store and buy your chocolate milk. So even the most basic of products are differentiated at this point in time. Things that we never would have thought of before as being differentiated. Even commodities are highly different. So how do we segment the markets? Well, we can take one product and have multiple segments. And this is the example the textbook gives you is magazine covers for different regions. There is a magazine out there that started out, and they used to have different ones, but they were all basically the same magazine. They merged into a company called 405. How many of you have seen the 405 magazine? So this magazine used to do something called Edmund Lifestyle or Edmund Living. And they used to have Nichols Hills Living, and then they used to have Oklahoma City. And it was basically the same magazine, and what they did is they changed out the cover on the magazine for, for various parts of the city that you lived in. Now the 405, they still do it, 
based on where they drop the magazine off, um, based on whether or not you're in North Oklahoma City in Edmond area or South Oklahoma City or Nichols Hills or places like that. When you used to get the paper, the Daily Oklahoman, the inserts would be different depending on where you were in the city. So basically it's one product. The news content was basically the same, although they would have an insert for if you lived in North Oklahoma City in the Sunday paper for things like that, or whether you lived in South Oklahoma City or downtown. You can have multiple products for multiple segments. So you have one product and you just try to update it or make it minor changes. You can have multiple products, for example, SUVs, cars, trucks, crossovers, hybrids. Why would anybody want a Toyota Prius? Because you're shallow and pretentious. <laughs> you want to let everybody know that you're a tree hugging bunny thumper, right? So, uh, you know. Why do you have an SUV? You got a big family. Although I don't know, why is it that every woman in Edmond drives those urban assault vehicles and seem to have no, no purpose for them? They don't seem to understand that four-wheel drive doesn't mean that you can stop on the ice, things like that. Or you can have mass customization, which is like Dell, where you actually ordered the product. You called Dell or you went online and you actually custom ordered the software suite that you wanted, the storage <coughs> capacity that you wanted, the memory, all of that. M&M's, I think I showed you that, didn't I? The, my M&M's is mass customized. You can now get M&M's in all these different uh, colors and, and varieties. You can get your creepy picture on the m and So how do we go about segmenting once we decide how we're going to do it? Um, the steps in segmenting. Well, we're going to group the buyers into segments. and. Depending on what kind of business we are is going to determine the criterion and how many segments we come up with. If we're a small business, we're probably going to do it on simplicity and cost effectiveness. What's the simplest way to segment people? Let's think about restaurants in Oklahoma City. What can you, if you decide you're a restaurateur and you want to open a restaurant, you can do it simplistically by just kind of thinking about what? Right. Yeah. There's just going to be people that are going to want high-end food, then sort of what? What's below high-end? What's called casual dining, chilies, things like that. And then at the bottom, fast food. What about food trucks? Where do they fit in? So food trucks used to be like sort of a blue-collar, Lower class, low proletariat. Where did they pop up? Around construction sites in big cities like New York City, Chicago. Food trucks have become what? They've become really popular and sort of what? Yep. They're not just they're not just burgers and hot dogs anymore uh, in the food truck. They've got all kinds of stuff, and so they're they're even segmenting. You should consider the potential to uh, increase your return on your investment. If you're not going to increase your return on your investment, why, why segment the product? It's not going to make any difference to you. Why segment? Do we segment gas all that much? Gas stations, do they really segment? Pretty much you open your gas station and you have three grades of gas and the prices are what? Now they try somewhat. <coughs> Shell, for example, tries to segment by saying what? That they've got really clean, you know, additives that, that will preserve the life of your engine. Does anybody really pay attention to that? Some anybody? people do. Some people. Some people do. Most people don't. They buy gas when what? Yeah, when the, when the light on the car says empty. The similarity of the needs of potential buyers, the different needs among the different segments, and the potential for marketing action to reach a segment. So there's no point in segmenting beyond what you can reach. If you can't get to that target, you can't, you can't satisfy it. There's no point in segmenting it. Are there differences, for example, between the Northeast and Oklahoma? So there are differences maybe even in taste and what people will tolerate between the Northeast and, and, and Oklahoma in terms of food, do you think? Does Brahms need to worry about that? 
do they need to segment into you know, what the northeastern people want in their ice cream and dairy store? No, why? Because <coughs> what? And why aren't they there yet? There yet? They have, they're a vertically integrated company, and so they don't want to go beyond where they can reach with their own. So they, Brahms has what? They go from dairy to store with their products. And they don't want to, so segmenting for people in New York who might tolerate different kinds of ice cream, we're fairly proletarian in our tastes in ice cream here in, in, in Oklahoma. Uh, if you go to Saratoga Springs, they've got these wild flavors where my brother uh, used to live. And I, it's like, oh God, that just doesn't even sound, you know, good. Pistachio, cherry, strawberry, frappuccino latte. Why the hell would you want that? It just sounds like a big mess. Like, I'm from Oklahoma. Chocolate, vanilla, that's fine. Put sprinkles on it, that's high limit. So, <clears throat> you know, they're not going to worry about, about that segment. Like, you can't reach it. Okay, so the ways to segment. The easiest way is for things like just geographic. If you go to Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is one of two of my hometowns, what would you find there that you wouldn't find a lot of in Oklahoma City? Anybody been to Santa Fe, New Mexico? What'd you go to Santa Fe for? Family there? When'd you go? Several times. Did you go in the winter? No, never been in the winter. Anybody been to Santa Fe in the winter? What do they have in Santa Fe in the winter that we don't have a lot of here? Snow and mountains. We have, like, they call things mountains here in Oklahoma. We have Mount Scott. It's more like a big hill. It's not really a mountain. So what do you find in Santa Fe, New Mexico that you don't find a lot of in Oklahoma City? Yeah, snow ski shops. We have one. It's down on May Avenue that carries it. But what do you find in Oklahoma that you don't find a lot of in New Mexico? Well, we have a lot of lakes here in Oklahoma, so you find what kind? You don't find snow skis, but you do find fishing. find fishing. You find uh, water skis and wakeboards, not snowboards. You find wakeboard stuff here in Oklahoma. You don't find a lot of that. When I was getting my PhD at New Mexico State, which is in beautiful Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is in the middle of the desert, it's down on the border between uh, Mexico, Texas, and New Mexico. It's kind of this three corners area down there. They asked kids in, in the third grade where they're most likely to see a boat. And kids in Las Cruces that were surveyed said that they were most likely to see a boat on the highway. <laughs> Why is that? They're towing it from some place. Yeah, there's no lakes. There's one lake that's about two hours from Las Cruces that's just big enough to put a boat on. It's called Elephant Butte. It's rather like a big mud hole in the middle of the dead. It's the ugliest place on the planet. It's like a moonscape out there. You don't see a lot of boats. You don't go and, you know, the Yamaha dealer in Las Cruces doesn't sell personal watercraft. They don't sell wave runners. What do they sell? They sell quads and side-by-sides, things like that. They don't sell personal watercraft. You go to the Yamaha dealer here and what do they sell? They sell a lot of personal watercraft. They also sell quads, but they actually sell less of those here than they do in New Mexico because if you want to use a quad or a side-by-side, -side, where do you have to go? You either have to have your own land here, because can you just ride them around in the city streets? Not legally. Can you go to the parks here? You can go right out in Las Cruces, right outside of town, there's just all this land that's owned by the government, but they have all these trails on that you can take quads and dirt bikes and things like that on. If you want to do that in Oklahoma, you have, there's a few places you can go. Where can you go? You can go to Little Sahara, which is up by Enid, kind of north and west of Enid, 
or there's a couple of places in the southeast, but there's not a lot. You, you have to uh, go further. It's, it's easier to go and do uh, uh, Wave Runner. You can also segment by, so that's a very easy way to segment. It's less profitable maybe if you're just looking at geographic. Demographics, things like ethnicity, age, gender, and income. This is easy to do. Again, geographic, you can just figure out. You can just like, take regions that have similar needs. Even in Oklahoma, there's differences between western Oklahoma and eastern Oklahoma. What do we have a lot of in eastern Oklahoma? Trees. There's a lot more trees, there's a lot more lakes, and a lot more water. I'd be willing to bet that if you went to the Yamaha dealer in Sayre, Oklahoma, anybody know where Sayre, Oklahoma is? It's on I-40 West, past Weatherford, between Weatherford and Clinton. If you went to Sayre, I bet they have more quads for sale out there because people have more farmland that's more rural, more places to ride. Less water, though, so you might find less personal watercraft being sold out there. If you go to, I don't know, Ufala, Tulsa, there's lots of lakes big lakes, and so you find more personal watercraft. Demographics is another easy way to do it. Where can you get the demographic information? This is easy to get from the United States Census Bureau. You can get it really easily. They, they provide all kinds of data-rich, secondary data that you can, can get. When you want to open an Outback, if you want to buy an Outback franchise, one of the things that they're going to require is that, A, you have a certain amount of money. I think you have to be worth about $1.5 million to open an Outback franchise. And then they're going to tell you that you can't open it in places like Guthrie just because of basic demographics. Guthrie's a town of about 10,000. We've been a town of about 10,000. Since the capital left uh, uh, Guthrie, and um, we became a state in 1907. We lost the capital in 1910 in a very famous case called Coyle versus Smith. And Oklahoma City boomed overnight, and Guthrie became a sleepy little town that, that almost you know, dried up and blew away. And it went from being on its first day in 1889, when Guthrie was settled in a land run, we had 30,000 people in the city. And when the capital left, it shrunk within almost equally as rapid a period of time to about 10,000. So you're not going to open an Outback in Guthrie because of a couple things. One, you don't have 50,000 people, which is what they require for an Outback. And two, you don't have the what? Income level How to sustain it. How is it still a 5A school? How is it what? Still a 5A school. Because students. they support all of the surrounding areas. So Guthrie School District comes all the way to Edmond. Uh, it actually goes <coughs> south of Waterloo Road in parts. Which is why you'll find if you drive down Waterloo Road, there's a big differentiation in the price difference on houses, depending on what side of the street you live on and whether or not this, it's in Edmond, it's an Edmond School District or Guthrie School District. If you go to the Guthrie School District, it drops the price of houses by about 20 percent. Even though Guthrie has, I think, better education than Edmond does. When I graduated from Guthrie High School. We had three National Merit Scholars. We had one high school. Edmund had one National Merit Scholar and three high schools. So I'm not sure that Guthrie, I'm not, I think we get kind of a bad rap. But I hate Edmund, so. <laughs> it's a rivalry between Guthrie and Edmund that, that, has, that runs deep. Um, but they have all of that, then they go all the way. They get Langston and Coyle, because they don't have a high school anymore. Mulhall, Orlando, and all the way to Oklahoma. So it's a big district. That's how they have that number of students. The um, best way to do it is probably using psychographics. That's the most expensive way to segment markets. And I asked you all to take the VAL survey. How many of you took the VAL survey and found out what kind of consumer type you are? That provides an enormous amount of rich data that we can use to, seg to segment um, people based on their lifestyles. We can also look at behavioral and usage rates in the segmentation process. So we're going to group products to be sold into categories. So if you think about this, and there's an entire field of retail called retail anthropology that does this. So we're going to group categories of items in stores based on the layout. If you go into Walmart, they're almost all laid out in a similar fashion. They've got what? Do you find shirts and sandals and flip-flops over in the beer aisle? 
We might, depending on the season, but basically, no. They're going to group them where? In clothing, based on male, female, gender, things like that. So you can also develop marketing grids and you can estimate the size of markets. So you'll put your markets on a horizontal row and then your products in vertical columns. So it will look like your markets, one, two, three, and then your products. And that's what I want you to do for today's critical thinking challenge. One, two, three. I want you to come up with and then estimate the size of each cell. I'm going to not have you do the third part of it. I just want you to do a critical thinking exercise, putting products based on the Apple iPhone 7. And just one, one feature of the iPhone 7. So the iPhone, for years and years and years from the time it was released until very recently, had three categories. I'm going to tell you why they had three categories. Because we have a taxonomy in this country that was largely developed, by the way, by McDonald's, and that taxonomy is small, medium, and large. It's one of the reasons that I think Starbucks is the tool of the devil, and I hate them. <laughs> because you go into Starbucks, and they have really messed with the taxonomy. I go into Starbucks, and I want a... They have crappy coffee, which is another reason that I don't like Starbucks. I mean, they're tool of the devil. So you go into Starbucks and you say, I want a medium con coffee. You mean a grande? Which is not grand, by the way. Like, what, what you know, they, like, they screwed up the taxonomy. No, don't correct me. I'm the customer. I want a medium coffee. Grande, no, medium. Like, we have a taxonomy. And they have the small, is called a tall, which is short. It makes, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, right? I mean, their, their taxonomy is completely um, jacked. And then they have this large, which is a vente. What the hell is that? <laughs> Are you Italian? I, I mean, it's crazy. iPhone did the same thing until recently. So I want you to develop a marketing grid based on iPhone. So come up with what you think. So you can, the, the product is easy to come up with the three categories, right? I've already given that to you. What do you think the three segments are that they're trying to appeal? Come up with a name for each of those three segments and justify your choices for each of those three segments in one or two complete sentences. So for the big one, you know, you might come up, you can't use mine, uh, you know. I'll, I'll give you an example. What I would say is, you know, computer, I'll be, I'll be kind. Computer web wonder group. And that's going to be the big one. Come up with your own name for that category. Who you think fits into that. Um, justify it in one or two sentences. And then I want you to answer this. Why do you think Apple collapsed the memory starting with the iPhone 8? They just came up with two categories. So it becomes a binary choice for the iPhone 8. And you should do that in three sentences. And I've created a Dropbox. I will give you 15 minutes, and then we'll talk about your answers. It's a group project. Yeah, there's a group Dropbox. If you don't have a computer, you can write it down, take a snapshot of it, and, and drop it into the Dropbox. All right, so let's see what brilliant responses you came up to. So name your segments for each of the one and tell me why you think that person or that group uh, fits in that, would want that particular thing. Let's see, we'll do first row, second row, and then third row, and I'll go from the east side this time to the west side. So we'll start on the front row. Who's Who's got the front row? <laughs> All right. So for the uh, three segments, we decided to go with um, break it up into uh, personal use, okay. to luxury use, and then to business use. Okay. Uh, personal use, like you don't need as much memory just for your own personal like you know uses or whatever, different options. 
a luxury just an extension of like you know just more stuff more options more ability to like store stuff all that good stuff. your videos things like that right okay yeah. and then business um, just for more options of work related uh, bigger like documents bigger videos if you need it presentations uh, so th those are the three we went with and we thought that Apple collapsed the categories into two because um, it felt like they just kind of needed to like three would, might have been a little excessive and so kind of what we're talking about in class, like if you don't really need to go somewhere, then why go there? And so two might have been a little more efficient mm -hmm. and just like, you know, utilizing um, just what you have and just kind of like downsizing and like focusing on what really sells. And we also thought if, if they went with the 64, it's kind of like a good in-between for the 32 and the 128. Mm -hmm. And so you get uh, kind of the best worlds of every scenario here. So that, that's what we came up with. Okay. So... You think that uh, you think that they just did it because there wasn't that much differentiation between the three categories. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. So we decided to classify the three groups into uh, one for uh, techies and developers, two okay. for business men and women, uh, and those like different status symbols, and then three for entertainment or people jumping on the bandwagon. Um, and pretty much what we decided was like, I don't know, we like we collapsed the memory into two categories um, to just simplify the choice for potential buyers, um, so that there's no like there's no you know in between. It's like it's either you're with us or against us. You know? um, I mean, not necessarily an ultimatum, but an ultimatum in a sense. So, what do you think the two categories are are going to be? You know, since they've collapsed it into two, what you basically decided when you do that is that there isn't any differentiation in that third category, that people either fall into one or the other. Right. So those categories would be like entertainment or business. If those, if, you know, if we had to put those two in the categories. Okay. So it's basically personal versus people that are buying it for their, for business, like, you know, L3. Okay. All right. Let's see. We'll start on the second row. Which group is... All right. Uh, we split it up into mainly based on age, but we call it the school age, career age, and retirement age. Okay. Um, school age being 10 to 22, career 22 to 60, and retirement 60 plus, 61 plus. Okay. Um, we kind of split it up that way because, you know, when you're school age at 10 to 20, you might, A, still be relying on your parents to purchase those phones, uh -huh. but they're also more likely to absorb the most entertainment and more space so they can run the full game of all three of them depending. Um, career age, they kind of lean heavier on the larger size for files, you know, that type of thing. Or retirement, they're more on the smaller size because they might not necessarily be up to date on technology or need all the space per se. Right, they're not downloading their YouTube videos yeah, or things or, like or, that. Yeah, they have pictures of their grandkids and that's about it. Okay. Sorry. All right. And then, uh, as far as the collapse or collapsing down to two options, we did it. We thought of it more along the lines of uh, given three options. Most, if they don't know what they need, if a consumer doesn't know, they'll pick usually the middle of the road. That's an interesting point. That'll probably get you bonus points because okay. that's absolutely true. Um, everybody, everybody chooses basically the the middle. I mean, one of the things we know. Until McDonald's did away with charging differences in price points between small, medium, and large, everybody chose the middle. The middle yeah. yeah. And so taking that away, basically, if, if they are on the fence about the 60-40, then more likely they go ahead to the, to the much larger size. But having that, retaining the 64 gig allows those people who don't really need the space or know they won't use the space to still have a cheaper option. Okay. So it kind of gives them the illusion of choice. Okay, all right. What's the next group on the second row? Uh, we, are, we decided to uh, split it up into functionality, entertainment, and business as well. Okay. The functionality is uh, kind of just a general uh, aspect of the iPhone in terms of screen display and size, um, 3D touch, and basic iPhone features, so it's called text, but how accessible they are. And for entertainment, we chose. Um, so, who do you think is going to choose the functional? Just functional. Older, okay. Um, the entertainment segment, we uh, 
we said uh, they would make their decision based off the storage and downloading and streaming features uh, such as movies and shows because some people want to you know, download movies, watch on an airplane, things like that, as well as screen size and uh, just in terms of how they wanted to do their screen and accessibility to that. And business, um, we said uh, basically in terms of storage, how much they're going to need. I mean, not everybody does all their business on their iPhones, like a lot of people have computers that they have. And uh, being the way that iPhones are able to connect with other people's phones if they don't have iPhones, that's an option. And they would choose that just in terms of like collaborating with meetings and business ideas. Because I mean, if you have a PowerPoint that you have to have streamed through other people's iPhones, like you know, you can open up an iPhone and other people can see your screen. Mm -hmm. That would be an accessible thing to do. Okay. All right. I think that's a good argument. Okay, very good. Here's the next group on the second row. All right. Okay, so we did the same thing similar to the group before Josh's with the age group. Um, we did 60 to older, 35 to 59, and 12 to 35. Um, and then obviously 60 to older, uh, they're not as technology advanced. Um, they're not going to download YouTube and streaming stuff and watch shows on their phone like our age group would. Um, and as far as the Apple collapsing their memory to two categories, um, we said to force more of their marketing segments to purchase a higher memory. Okay. All right. Have they come up with a, a feature that replaces the, the storage? Most people have no idea what kind of storage they're going to need. When I first got... You know, when I first started video recording my classes, I had no idea. It actually turns out that it's because I, if I run out of storage on this, I can switch over to recording it on my phone, but it eats up a huge amount of storage space really quickly, video files do. And so this last time I was more educated and I got the bigger, um, the bigger storage because I was like, I, I store an enormous amount on my phone. Now I get rid of it as soon as I upload it to YouTube, but it's still, it could run into a problem. Do you think most people know? Do you think that there's something else that they've replaced that category with? It seems like most of Apple's gone to a binary choice. You either have the plus, I mean, they don't have three sizes of phones, do they? It's, it's either... Well, they, at one point, they had like a 6, a 6S, and an SE. Right. Like they got rid of the SE, the like, why do I want that? Right. So they've, they've gone to a lot of binary choices. All right. Anything else? Um, we kind of talked about how, like, how Apple and marketing, like, how it's just kind of crazy because Android, like, they had this new stuff for a while, and Apple, like, slowly comes out with my Android, you know? But everybody always seems to choose Apple. Well, Apple started out as the leader, and yeah. now they may be the follower yeah. in terms of features. But they still get chosen. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's see. We'll start on the back row. The first group, who's over there? Which? All right. So, we based our, ours largely off of other people have a type of customer. 32 would be like customers on a budget. The elderly, because they don't fix too much for them anymore. Okay. Um, Okay, that's an interesting point that you said the elderly are on a budget. The biggest transfer of wealth in this country is actually from what? No, no, I, I meant to say was they're, they're not necessarily on a budget. The richer, I mean, the wealth, the older rich, obviously, but I meant to say that they don't need more phones. Okay. They can't figure it out anyway. All right. <laughs> oh, so now they're rich and dumb. Yeah. Is that what you're... Well... <laughs> obviously for professionals and professional uses and then I think largely there's a lot of people that are in the phone market as a status symbol more than a necessity. Uh -huh. like people buy the biggest and the best because they can show it off because it shows hey I have the money for this, I have the money for this <coughs> too. Instead of actually, because nobody needs that much, I mean nobody really needs any of this. So um, I think that and that's why I think it collapsed in two categories. Is that way, it, it was really for profit. That way, if you need more than 64, you're forced to pay the premium for the 256. 
instead of having a nice middle of the road option? I think that, depending on what you wrote, that may get you all bonus points because that's an interesting, is that the profit margin on the top end is a lot greater because it doesn't cost that much more in terms of the manufacturing process to add the memory anymore. That's, that's become fairly, fairly cost efficient. The biggest cost is in actually the transportation in the box and stuff like that. So, okay, all right, very good. All right. Okay. Can you project? Oh, sorry. So that the camera will pick it up. They said the uh, 32 gigabyte, maybe like 18 and under. Uh huh. And uh, 40 and over. Uh, 18 and under because uh, parents are buying the kids smartphones and stuff now, stuff to start off with. And like other people said, uh, older people probably don't need as much space. And then the 128 gigabyte is kind of. For all the Right. I think that's right. Yeah. If you've if you've got 128, you're not gonna go you're not gonna go down, but you will go up because you're gonna be paranoid. It's it's like if you cut a board too long, you can always take some off. You can't necessarily. And Apple's not good about letting you add. You know. I mean, it's not like a computer where it's after the fact you can add on to it. You can add memory. Okay. okay. What's the, Okay. The average users who like us just call text, you know, just a little internet, and then high intent users who are like gamers, photographers, you know, video editors who have their phone every day and are constantly on them using them for work. And that would just go from hot to low from the first one. And we said that they maybe took the middle one out because when we're comparing the numbers side by side, if I'm going to buy a new phone, I'm I'm gonna be scared like I'm not going to have enough data if I get the lowest one, so I might as well get the highest one. Like, that's what I automatically think. And I want to think back to, oh, it was 128, what I had in the middle. I want right. to remember that one. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. You're not going to go. You're not going to go less. You're going to probably go more. Um, so they're they're assuming that there's not a lot of differentiation between the middle and the high, that there's a bigger distinction between the middle and the low, and you can collapse it into two categories, high and low. All right. Who's the next one? Okay. And we said that standard is more for those that are using the phone, but mainly for its standard primary use. So we only make calls, texting, whatever, that's it. Um, and then we did the 128, which we would have called the extra. Uh -huh. um, and that would have been more of like luxury use, maybe more storage if you're taking more pictures and using, maybe have more apps on it. And then we did the 256 as an elite, and we use that mainly towards businesses. Maybe meeting a person that may have multiple emails or multiple um, applications they may have on their phone, maybe you need to constantly be on their phone, constantly you know, using more storage. Okay. All right, I like the names that you came up with for the categories. That's interesting. That will probably win you bonus points. Uh, we chose age, like time frames. So the first one would be like retirement, uh, elderly people. The second would be kids to high school, just like learning how to use it, and talking like mainly for social. The third one would be for college to like the end of career, using it for their school. All apps that they have to have to access all of the stuff. 
uh, why we think the Apple collapse the memory capacities is mainly because of cost. They don't have to spend as much to produce a third option. And uh, I guess it makes the choice easier for people to have two courses instead of one. So you think that people are more price sensitive than they are actually uh, sensitive to how much functionality they're going to use with it? Yeah. People take stuff out of fear a lot of times, too. I mean, if there's only two choices, you make it the more expensive one because you're worried, like you said, that 64 may not be enough. So I feel mm -hmm. like it almost might have been a little bit of a marketing ploy where you're going to get the more expensive one because you're worried that the lowest one, the most basic one, won't do it for you. Okay. All right. Very good. How many more groups? Do I have two? Or just one? Two. Two? Okay. All right. So we divide ours in like casual use, modern use, and high volume use. So okay. Like casual is going to be like like baby boomers, your parents' age. They use those like a Facebook or Candy Crush machine. You don't really need it or anything else. Uh, or anyone on a budget that just wants to new up like I do, but those don't pay all that much more. Mm -hmm. And then you have the moderate users, which are going to be kids around our age that have more towards necessities for music, for photos. And for kids that beg their parents for 256, but their parents gave them a 128 kind of kind of thing. Uh, so you think they negotiate? Yeah, with their, negotiate. Okay. Kind of thing. And then the high volume is going to be for. Anyone that needs it for like professional photographers, photos, videos, and need to store a high amount of like high data items on it. And anyone that's had an iTunes library for a long time, that is all the tons of music that can be transferred over. And then for the next question, I thought it was basically because the people that are so used to the iPhone interface, like my parents are baby boomers, they don't want to go to Android because it's complicated to them, so they're going to have to push to go to the 32 to the 64 because they just want to have what they're used to, and they're mm -hmm. going to pay the extra dollar for it. And then they're going to push to people that have 128 to 256 because they've already had so much storage already on their phone, they're going to have to go or else they can kind of downgrade a bunch of stuff they have. And I think it's smart for Apple to cut down on production. Why not just make two phones and make them three different kinds of phones? Okay. All right. It could cut down on marketing costs, too. Yeah. Okay. Where's our... All right. <clears throat> so our group, the, the three marketing segments that we came up with were also age-based. We divided it into the millennials, the geezers, and the tweeners. Okay. I, <laughs> I like your names. <laughs> <clears throat> kind of. And uh, we, we, for the sake of simplicity and also being on the same page, millennials we define as being up to the age of 30, the tweeners 30, the retirement age of 65, and then 65 older we label geezers. Okay. And uh, millennials we've decided that would be more likely to go with the more expensive, higher, higher uh, storage capacity model just because they have a lot more data usage and storage demands, the tweeners. We said love the functionality of these Apple products. However, they're a lot more um, frugal-minded than the millennials. More intelligent, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, so they're more likely to be on the fence with the 128. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some that are going with the, the smaller and some that are going with the larger. Uh, but then the older generation the re of retirement age, we decided would go with the, the lowest, just because they don't have as much activity on their phones as uh, younger generations. And as far as the iPhone 8 question, only offering two options allows no middle ground for the indecisive. So it would effectively get rid of the, the tweener generation. <coughs> so it would essentially be the millennials and everyone else, I think, with those two categories. And uh, more likely, you know, people are going to be going with the higher end option, allowing Apple to make more money, just because of like what other people were saying, is the fear of running out of space. Most people don't run out of space, though. I mean, I'm kind of odd because I store stuff on it, like with videos, but a lot, most people actually don't ever run out of space. All right, very good. Um, I will see you guys a week from today. Good answers. Yes, sir? The Dropbox.